Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for making it out to this event. The Manhattan Project stands on a very simple principle that it takes more than just a good general to win a war. That general needs capable and loyal officers, and that those officers need capable and loyal soldiers below them. When we brought Donald Trump into office, we brought a fighter into office, a general that was loyal to our cause, and a fellow New Yorker like many of us. But we made a miscalculation. We failed to take into account one major factor. Donald was not a politician. He was navigating hostile, unmarked territory, a maze carved by the career politicians, which only they knew the twists and turns of. When our president embarked on his journey into that maze, he put his trust into individuals who claimed that they would guide him through quickly and safely. But time and time again, they stalled him, led him into dead ends, and sometimes into the direct path of hazards. This is the threat many ambitious political rebels face when they first take office. We've overcome the establishment's first line of defense. We managed against the odds to win election to office as a true America first candidate. Now good luck getting anything done. They will stall you, they will suppress you, they'll do anything they can to stop you. Just look at what they're putting Trump through right now. I say no more. Our goal is to establish the infrastructure necessary for our representatives to navigate that maze, to provide every general with capable and loyal officers, and to provide every officer with capable and loyal soldiers. To ensure every one of those soldiers is properly trained for the service they must provide in a rugged and unforgiving theater of battle in which they are fighting. Too long have we run from the allegorical swamps of our state and national capitals, but we have retreated to the realm of small town politics because we lack the courage or confidence to win big battles. Manhattan Project is the recruitment center and boot camp that will produce the political manpower necessary to win the battles that turn the tides of war. With that said, and without further delay, allow me to introduce our next speaker. He is a Trump administration insider. He served on President Trump's transition team and became the youngest commissioned officer in the White, Ho in White House history. James Bacon. But it's good to be back in New York City because this is where my journey with Trump began. Um, I was just a freshman at NYU and I went to my first college Republicans meeting ever. And randomly they said that the New York, that the, uh, the Trump campaign in Trump Tower was looking for interns. And literally everyone in the room laughed. I was the only one who raised my hand and said, I want to try that. And next thing I knew, I was interviewing at Trump Tower and I started on the campaign in September 2015. So it, it's been a crazy journey since then. I stuck with the campaign, I made it onto the transition team, I worked in the administration for all four years, and I even worked with Trump in his post-presidency. And tonight I want to talk about the Trump personnel, because there's been a lot of talk about personnel, especially lately. You see DeSantis kind of taking some pokes at Trump. A lot of people say Trump demanded too much loyalty of his people. Some people say Trump didn't demand enough loyalty. You know, you hear Trump fired too many people. Trump didn't fire enough people. So as somebody who was there the whole time and who actually ran personnel for Trump in his final year, I wanna tell you guys what actually happened. So, when I joined the Trump campaign, this was the golden era of the Trump personnel. And we actually have a couple people in the audience who were there in those days. But when I joined, it was literally like four full-time staffers in Trump Tower on the fifth floor, and then like four more interns. And the only people who were there at that time were people who either believed in Trump himself as a man and saw his success and thought that that was needed for our country, or they believed in the 2016 ideals that he stood for. Everyone at that time was taking a risk by working for Trump. So you had this team of people who weren't there to climb the career ladder. They really were there for him. And there was zero infrastructure. I mean, our, we barely have a campaign uh, office in Iowa, barely. Um, the campaign was Mr. Trump picking which city to fly to next. The biggest expense was jet fuel. He would fly to a city, rant for two and a half hours about literally whatever was coming into his head at that moment. <laughs> no speech writers, no teleprompters, no talking points. It was pure Trump, right? And that is how he built his movement. So like I said, this was the golden era. It was a lean, mean team and it allowed President Trump to be himself. 
No one thought they knew more than him. No one thought they were smarter than this guy. It was, uh, that would all come later. So, so Trump wins the nomination for the Republican office, right? To be the Republican nominee for president. And this is when the establishment first got their beachhead on the Trump campaign. Reince Priebus, who was the chairman of the RNC, played it very smart. He basically said to Trump, I am going to get the rest of the GOP on board with supporting you as our nominee. And I'm going to give you the RNC's campaign infrastructure because you're gonna need it against the Clinton machine. We needed that, it was true, and Reince did a good job. The problem was, that came at the cost of allowing the RNC into the building itself. There, there was a day when they literally took over the 14th floor of Trump Tower. And so they were within Trump Tower, they were there. Luckily, Trump was still trusting his own instincts, running his own campaign, not listening to Reince who was telling him, you need to tone down your attacks on Hillary Clinton. You need to, he even told Trump that he needed to drop out of the race after the Access Hollywood tape came out. And, and Trump didn't listen to them. So he was still fully in control and everything. But allowing them in kind of would set the stage for what would then happen on the transition team. So Trump wins. And he is immediately focused on dealing with all these foreign leaders, um, picking and interviewing his cabinet in New York City and Bedminster, meeting with Kanye West, you know, like doing, all, doing all the fun stuff. It, in the meantime, the transition team started in Washington, D.C. And Mike Pence was put in charge of it, and a few other people, and that's when they opened the floodgates to the Washington, D.C. establishment. That is when the establishment fully infiltrated. And I was a young guy just coming off the campaign, and it was a miracle I even made it to the transition. But I remember getting there and literally recognizing no one. I mean, it was, there, were no, there were hardly any campaign people. They had either been displaced or they'd been sent to the presidential inaugural committee, which is the group that planned Trump's inaugural ball. They weren't allowed near the policy stuff that was going on in the transition. The people that were in the transition, which is housed in the GSA building in Washington, DC, were Bushies. They were mostly people who had served in George W. Bush's administration. And these people, they knew how government worked. They knew the lingo. They had relationships with these agencies. They knew the offices no one had ever heard of, but they were extremely powerful. And the few campaign staffers who were there, we didn't know any of this. We were, we were brand new to this. And Trump was in New York City dealing with all the high level stuff that the president needs to deal with. And so what happened on the transition was they wrote these things called agency action plans. And basically each agency had a plan and it had the policies for the next four years all written out in that three month period from November to January, the policy was established. The personnel was largely established in that three month period. The personnel for the key positions, the sub cabinet positions that no one had ever heard of, right? They staffed them with people they knew. And I tell people it's important to remember that these people weren't trying to undermine Trump. They didn't see it that way. They were running on Republican autopilot. They were hiring their friends that they knew. They were writing the agenda for the policies that the Republican Party had always wanted. It wasn't that they were trying to get Trump. It was that they didn't, they didn't get Trump. They didn't understand Trump had just rebuked the Republican establishment. So, so that, was, that was the problem on the transition team. And they staffed offices that were extremely powerful, like I mentioned, one of which was the Office of Presidential Personnel. And the Office of Presidential Personnel is the office that appoints the 4,000 political appointees that the president gets to place. And if you take one thing away from this tonight, it's that the power to appoint is the president's number one power. It's this number one way to influence the bureaucracy, to get his agenda across. Because at the end of the day, the legal authority of the presidency resides with your cabinet secretaries, your federal agencies, with the bureaucracy itself. It shouldn't be that way, but Congress has made it that way. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. So
So, um, for example, what is an executive order? An executive order is a piece of paper that says, please, Mr. Cabinet Secretary, will you do this? It's, it's a piece of paper that says, please, Department of Homeland Security, enact the travel ban. If you don't have your people at those agencies to actually carry out the policy, there's no guarantee that it will get done. And so the establishment knew this, and they put their people in charge of PPO. That's what it's called, Presidential Personnel. So when we got into the administration, I ended up um, becoming friends with Ben Carson's people, and they brought me into HUD. That was the Department of Housing and Urban Development that Ben Carson ran. So I was Ben Carson's assistant in the beginning of the Trump administration. But once we got in, we all became subject to PPO. They controlled if you were hired. They controlled if you were promoted. They controlled if you wanted to be reassigned somewhere. So what were they doing? Well, they weren't asking you if you had served on the Trump campaign or how you felt about Trump's policies. They weren't asking about your political experience and how you felt about the Trump agenda in 2016. None of that was taken into the, their decision to hire people. The only thing they were looking at was, okay, relevant experience. Is this person qualified to enter this job? And that is somewhat relevant, but these are political appointments. It's in the name. You need people that are aligned with you politically. It's the civil services job, the career bureaucrats. It's their job to have the expertise to actually run the thing. On top, the political appointees are supposed to give them the policy guidance that they need to run it. So this, this led to so many problems. Um, I'll give you a few examples. You guys have probably heard of uh, Darren Beatty. Uh, Darren Beatty was fired uh, by these people because he had attended a conference that Peter Brimelow spoke at. And Brimelow is just an illegal immigration hawk. And he, had, he hadn't even attended the same conference that Brimelow was at. It was just he had attended a conference that Brimelow had once attended. Anything that caused any disruption in the media, you would get fired for. So if you went into your job at HUD and you decided, I'm gonna like push the Trump agenda here, I'm gonna fight the bureaucracy here, these people would leak on you. And there would suddenly be a story about you in the Washington Post about how Trump wants to get rid of work, uh, get rid of you know public housing vouchers for whatever. The PPO office would then fire you because they viewed it as you were being disruptive. If you were too MAGA, you were viewed as a disruptive force. And this created a massive disincentive for getting the job done. Um, there was no incentive to enact the Trump policies in the bowels of the bureaucracy. The game that they wanted you to play was, we go along to get along with the bureaucracy, we tinker on the margins of things that they're producing, and then we call that conservatism. But we don't make any real waves. That was their game. So all of this created a, a bad, bad climate for the administration. Fast forward a couple years. I've been at HUD. I've been working my way up the ranks. I actually became the White House liaison for Ben Carson, and that's the job that interacts with PPO. And we hire people with PPO to the agency. So I hired people like Spencer, who's here tonight, based on loyalty to Trump, based on wanting to get the MAGA agenda into place. So I learned all this personnel stuff, and then Trump, to his credit, actually realized what no Republican president had realized before, that they needed to fully control this office because the exact same problems were happening with Reagan, but it was Trump who was said, we need to get someone in there that's a loyalist, that understands the agenda. I don't care if they're not qualified to run it. And so he appointed John McEntee, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, to run the presidential personnel office. And McEntee knew that I knew how this whole system worked, so he brought me in. And our goal was, we're gonna right the wrongs of the last three years. We immediately froze hiring. We immediately reviewed everything the other PPO had in process, and we found people that were nominated to the Senate who had literally been never Trumpers, and we had to withdraw these nominations from the Senate. We, um, we changed the entire process that it took for getting hired. 
So before, you didn't have, even have to talk about political loyalty. Now, you had to interview with us at the White House. You had to fill out a questionnaire explaining which of Trump's 2016 campaign platform you agree with the most and how you're gonna implement it at this agency. Um, we, we did a number of different reforms, but what basically ensued was this massive cultural shift in the administration. Suddenly, people actually were bending over backwards to accomplish the MAGA agenda because they knew if they didn't, we would fire them. We went in and we fired some of the top people. We fired John Rood, who was the undersecretary for policy at the Defense Department, massive neocon. He was giving us all kinds of problems. Um, we got rid of the head of the, the Director of National Intelligence because he had started to actually gin up this whole new Trump Russia thing. This is, it's very obscure, but this was actually reported on. He went and briefed Congress and said, well, you know what happened in 2016? It's happening again in 2020. The Russians want Trump to win again. And this was literally like our first day at PPO. We got in there and, and uh, Jared Kushner and all these guys were, were freaking out about this. And we we're like, all right, like, let us take care of it. So we moved this guy out and we quickly had to figure out how we could put Rick Grinnell in charge of the Directorate of National Intelligence to crush this stuff. And uh, it, was, it, was a very, it was a very hectic day, to say the least. But um, the biggest thing that we did actually came towards the end. And it was with the Pentagon also. So some of you probably have heard of Mark Esper. Mark Esper was Trump's Secretary of Defense. He had been a Raytheon lobbyist. And he had been publicly contradicting Trump over the BLM riots, which Trump wanted him to crush, and he wouldn't do it. He literally refused to do it, along with a few other people. Um, and he had contradicted Trump on withdrawing troops from overseas and things like that. Trump was very upset about this, and he wanted to fire Mark Esper. And this, this was a big deal, because Trump actually hates firing people. Contrary to popular belief, he, he does not like firing people. Uh, he's, he's very forgiving. He is an extremely forgiving boss. So when we heard he wanted to fire Esper, we were, we were pumped. Um, but we also kind of doubted it, like, okay, let's see if he's serious. Let's see if he's serious. In the meantime, John McEntee and I had appointed this guy, Christopher Miller, who was an NSC staffer, to be the director of counterterrorism. We had nominated him, and he had been confirmed by the Senate to the position. That, once you're confirmed by the Senate to a position, it makes you eligible to be acting in any other position. So, we knew this guy Chris Miller was good, and we met with Trump, and he said, give me some options for the next SEC death. I want a good Secretary of Defense. And so we thought about it, and we thought, you know, maybe this Chris Miller guy would be good. So McEntee and I met with Miller, and we're grilling him, right? And we ask him, Chris, What's the number one threat to the United States? And we were expecting to hear something like China or Russia or something. And he said, narcotics coming across the border, by far the number one national security threat. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what Doug McGregor said, who, who is another guy who's uh, very, very based and right wing on these things. But it was like, this is like a guy, Senate confirmed, that actually understands what's at stake here. We asked him, what's the most overrated threat to national security? And he said, are you guys ready for this? <laughs> China. And we're like, wow, that's interesting. Why do you say that? He said, because the military industrial complex sees the cash cow of the Middle East wars ending and they're pivoting to China. It's not as much of a threat, but they're hyping it up in that way. We were, our minds were blown. And I was like, okay, this guy wants to end the forever wars and wants to pull back, you know, the, the American overseas empire, the things Trump wanted to do. So we thought, okay, we've got our guy, but we have to somehow make it okay for us to appoint this low level, mid level guy to be Secretary of Defense. Because Chris Miller was a Green Beret battlefield commander just a few years prior, he had never climbed the ranks of the Pentagon, he had never played that game and become a general. 
So we told Trump, he, Trump is totally on board with this, right? Um, time, time goes by, we're not sure if he's gonna do it. And then one day we get called into the office early and it turns out Trump wants to get rid of Esper because he heard Esper was gonna resign and we wanted to fire him to not give him the satisfaction. We wanted to beat him to the punch. <laughs> Trump was like, I am not letting him resign. I am firing him. We are firing him. So we're like, great. Um, so we call, we call Chris Miller in and we're all there um, in the office that morning and he has no idea he's about to become Secretary of Defense. And he's, he's, in like khaki, he's in like khakis and like a suit jacket, no tie. And we're in there with Cash Patel. I don't know if you guys know Cash Patel. We're in there hanging out and Chris, we tell him and he's like, you, he's like, you bastards. He's like, you guys knew this was gonna happen, didn't you? He's like, God damn it. He's like giving us fun about it. But Cash uh, uh, came up with a plan, which was, listen, Chris, go home and change right now. Change into a suit, get in your car, drive to Virginia, go around the, the Pentagon area. And when Trump fires Esper, we will give you the signal and you can go into the Pentagon. <laughs> and he's like, all right, all right, I'll do it. So, so I go and I draft up the tweet for Trump. We give it to him in the Oval. We fire him. Trump, Trump actually fires Esper via tweet and names Chris Miller acting SecDef in the same tweet, okay? <laughs> you can do that, it's, a, it's legal. We, we also did the legal paperwork on the back end just to make sure, you know, I actually sent Esper a letter firing him formally. You never know what the tweets. Um, so there's Chris Miller, we give him the signal and he literally pulls up to the Pentagon visitor's gate at, in his Ford Focus and says, I'm, I'm the new secretary. And, and there it was, there it was. Um, it, it was kind of this surreal moment. Um, anyway, I was late, I was uh, having a late night at the White House that day and uh, my boss texted me and said, hey, stick around because Chris is coming back. He's gonna meet with Trump and I need you to like walk him over there. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I see like coming down the hallway this huge entourage and it's Chris Miller and he has like a military detail with him with Secret Service and literally a military aide carrying the nuclear codes following him around. And I was like, holy crap, like this guy just left here a few hours ago in his Ford Focus and he came back with a full motorcade with a nuclear code. <laughs> this, is, this is mind blowing right now. Um, so, so that was really fun. And, but, but on a serious note, he would go on to withdraw U.S. troops fully from Somalia, and he did a troop drawdown in Afghanistan and Iraq. Not a full one, obviously, in Afghanistan, but he did reduce the troop numbers there, and he he took serious steps towards getting rid of some of the neocons at the Pentagon and ending the forever wars. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And there were, there were a number of other accomplishments that we had at PPO because of this cultural change. Complete shutdown on immigration into the United States during the pandemic. It turns, out, it turns out this stuff is actually easy to do by executive action. Literally, you can just have the guy that signs off on the visas not sign the paperwork and you've stopped all immigration into the United States. You can use bureaucratic things like that. Um, but we also got rid of um, a regulation that the Obama administration had done, which was forcing public housing into areas as like this kind of forced diversify, uh, diversification social engineering program. We got rid of that. Um, there, there's a whole, a whole host of other things. But the takeaway is this. We can do this. And the secret is personnel. John and I would always pinch ourselves and say, there's no way they're gonna let us do this. Like I was literally still a college student taking classes at night while I was doing this. Like we're thinking any moment, like the generals are gonna walk in and say to Trump, you know, this was fun, but like you can't do this. <laughs> and they did attack us and then they fought us. And the cabinet secretaries were the worst because they didn't want a bunch of kids bullying them and telling them who they could hire. But we did it anyway, and we held strong. And the Washington Post and Politico attacked us viciously, and we stuck to our guns. 
And it just shows that you can actually do this. You can implement the MAGA agenda. You can get the civil service to do what you want. If you're not afraid of the media, if you stick to your guns, all of this is possible. It's all possible. So I want to get into some of the other stuff that we need to do in the future as well, because it's not enough, frankly, to get the personnel right next time. We have to get the personnel right, and we have to do it on the transition team the next time. We have to get it done early, but that's just the starting point. Guys, there are 2 million government employees. There are 18 million contractors. The government is compri the federal government is comprised of 20 million people. The president gets 4,000 political appointees to oversee them. That's it. That's what we're up against. All of those appointees need to be aligned with the agenda. If they're not, you don't even have a starting team to start playing against the deep state. You're, you're, it's over before it begins. So that's why the transition team is very important. But once you get in there, you, the president and his team need to actively manage these people. And there's a number of ways to do that. I was on War Room recently just talking about this. There was an agency created in the 70s called the Office of Personnel Management. And it was actually created to help the president manage the deep state because it had become such a problem. So this office has the authority to set the pay, set the promotion requirements, set the pension benefits, the health care benefits for every federal employee of the government. You can also use things called reduction in force exercises that are determined by this agency where you can just determine that certain positions and offices are completely obsolete and fire thousands of people. Um, so there, the tools are there. And the last, the last OPM director to do this was Reagan's, and he fired over 100,000 bureaucrats just by using reduction in force exercises. So all these tools are there. Um, we have to use all of them. You guys have probably heard of Schedule F, right? Some of you have heard of Schedule F. That's one of like 10 things we need to do. We need to be reassigning bureaucrats to remote locations and firing them if they won't go. We need to be doing reduction in force exercises. We need to be doing Schedule F, but Schedule F only applies to the lower level bureaucrats. It only allows you to fire the lower level ones that aren't as powerful. We need to be reclassifying the senior executive service positions and making them political positions converting them to political appointment positions. If all else fails, um, we need to do something I like to call the Dick Cheney method. <laughs> Dick Cheney was known for having an office in every important federal agency. If you've seen the movie Vice, they actually show this. He had an office at the State Department. He had an office at the Pentagon. He had an office in a lot of other places. He would actually be at the agency itself where they're carrying out the policy and he'd be telling these bureaucrats what to do. So what the next president needs to do, imagine President Trump doing this. Imagine President Trump visiting the State Department unannounced, walking in on these bureaucrats and telling them, hey, where are we with that? Where are we with this policy I told you guys to do a few weeks ago? Um, and if they refuse to do it, he can fire them on the spot. Because if they're refusing an order from their commander in chief, then suddenly you have legal cause to fire them. So we need to get very hands-on and creative if this is gonna work. Because like I said, you're starting with a disadvantage when you're going up against the deep state. Um, all that being said, what I'm working on now with my colleague Spencer Pretian is something called Project 2025. Project 2025 is an attempt to get the personnel ready for the next transition now. Get the political appointees that are aligned ready in a database, sorted into certain positions so that we can hit the ground running next time. Because the Trump transition was crazy. Chris Christie had been in charge of it, right? 
before they fired him and put Pence in charge. And none of the people on the transition thought Trump was gonna win. So they weren't even prepared. They weren't even ready with appointees to go. Project 2025 solves that problem and gets us ready for that. And I wanna, I wanna introduce my colleague Spencer, and we're gonna take questions after that, but I wanna introduce my colleague Spencer, who was actually the guy that we hired at the Presidential Personnel Office to oversee the State Department, the Justice Department, and the United States Agency for International Development. And Spencer is the Deputy Director of Project 2025. So he's gonna talk more about it, and hopefully we'll get all of you guys, you uh, good patriots here, signed up for the project. But thank you. James, and thank you all for hosting us here uh, at this storied conservative club. Uh, as James mentioned, my name is Spencer Cradian. I'm the associate director of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project, which is organized by the Heritage Foundation. And I also uh, worked with James alongside him as one of the five associate directors of the Presidential Personnel Office. Um, I would echo everything James said about the importance of personnel um, and when the president makes a decision, you as a political appointee do not know better. Um, and it was my job, it was our job when we were interviewing people, when we were vetting people, recruiting people for political appointments at all levels to think what would President Trump want us to be asking this person? What is he looking for in this position? Um, the good news is we get to do it all again through Project 2025. Um, I'll give you the, the general overview of the project. It's organized by the Heritage Foundation, but it's not just the Heritage Foundation. We have more than 50 conservative groups on our advisory board, um, and these include groups from DC, from Real America, more conservative, more populist, more libertarian. We've kind of got a big tent, um, but we are, uh, as a movement, recognizing the importance of these problems and understanding the importance of learning from past Republican administrations and their mistakes. We have the support of uh, just about every department at Heritage we work with. Uh, we, there are four pillars to the project. The first is Mandate for Leadership. This is a policy book, it's coming out next week. It's based on the original Heritage Mandate for Leadership in 1980. The legend is that at the first meeting of President Reagan's cabinet, everybody had a copy on their chair. But this goes agency by agency through the, uh, through the federal government. Chris Miller uh, wrote the chapter on the Department of Defense, for example, and each uh, chapter corresponds to an agency and it outlines what a conservative success looks like at that agency in 2025 and for the next four years. That's coming out next week um, and it'll be at project2025.org. The second pillar is what James was talking about, the Presidential Personnel Database. We are doing the next conservative president's work ahead of time by getting the people into this database vetting them, sorting them into buckets for different agencies, different levels, different positions, so that we will be able to hand to the official transition and hand to the future Presidential Personnel Office whole slates of recommendations for positions across the federal government. The third pillar is our Presidential Administration Academy. That's live uh, at project2025.org. And these are basically uh, online uh, lectures, on-demand trainings, uh, interactive quizzes and things about being a political appointee and serving at the pleasure of the president. Everything from how to do your security clearance paperwork, where are my kids going to go to school if I live in Washington, D.C., um, to how to be a general counsel at an agency, how to be a deputy assistant secretary, how to work with the careers when you have to, how to deal with the press and things like that. We want the new blood in Washington and we want it to be well trained up ahead of time before they go in to the next administration. And then the fourth pillar um, is what we call the playbook, and that is the actual transition writing uh, plans for each agency. So taking the big ideas that I mentioned that are in the big book uh, and figuring out, okay, what is what needs to happen on day one, day two, all the way out to the first six months of the new administration. Um, you know, how are we gonna fire this person? How are we gonna reorganize this office? How are we gonna use reduction in force uh, strategies that James was talking about. And also, of course, what are the pre-written regulations or the pre-written executive orders that the president and his team need to be ready to sign? Um, 
So that's the goal of this project. We have a lot of flyers in the back. You can go to project2025.org. Um, but we're doing the work ahead of time so that we avoid some of the problems that have plagued past conservative administrations. And we see the candidates also talking about the importance of things like this. We all know that on November 6, 2024, suddenly everybody's gonna be really interested in everything that we've been doing. Don't be like those people, get involved now. Um, get involved early and we won't have the problem that that uh, James was talking about where after the election the floodgates open and everybody who had uh, not looked at a finger to help the president during his campaign suddenly came in to staff the transition of the administration and uh, there were some some of them I assume were, were good people um, <laughs> but uh, so get involved now we know that Wall Street's going to be ready for the next Republican president we know that K Street's going to be ready we know that big tech and big pharma and the defense contractors they're all going to have their agenda they're all going to have their list they're all going to have their wish list of things they want to get done uh, but what about us well we can be ready as part of project 2025 um, and I would just echo one other thing that James was talking about, and that is the question of experience. Um, it's very important to remember that when you're talking about political hiring and political appointments, the Presidential Personnel Office, which represents the President, decides who has the right experience, what experience they're looking for, and it's not like going on usajobs.gov. It's, it's not a competitive process. It's the accepted service. So don't sell yourself short. I kind of did that early in the Trump administration. I said, well, I could never do, I could never work for the government. How am I gonna, you know, I'm just a kid. Um, I, I don't know the intricacies of agencies. You will figure that stuff out. If you have the right values, if you're loyal to the, the president and the agenda that he ran on, and if you are willing to work hard and put in long hours and have a good political instinct of how to do battle on behalf of a conservative president, if you have that, you will figure out the other stuff. You'll figure out how to navigate the agency. You'll become a policy expert. You'll, you'll gain experience. You'll develop a portfolio and all that stuff. So don't worry that you're not qualified uh, because if you have the right values um, and the willingness to work hard and good political sense, and you're exactly the type of person that Project 2025 is looking for. I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, as, as members of this club are familiar and as James kind of talked about, we as uh, conservatives, as America First people, have been served up some, some pretty thin gruel over the, the years <laughs> by the political establishment. But through Project 2025, we really have a chance to uncover the, the feast that's out there waiting for us, and we need you all to be a part of it. So thank you. We're going to take questions too, so Paul Spencer and I. Yep. Hi, so in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, that Trump took a while to realize that, oh, the personnel was actually important. Whereas for the layman or for the average person who was interested in Republican politics, it was evident that a certain agenda, let's say the Jared agenda or whatever, it was being implemented, while other agendas, the MAG agenda, was not. So why you said it was actually a, a quick realization, even though it was three, down, three years down the line? But why did this take so long? That's a, that's a great question. And you have to go back to the transition team and, and PPO. It wasn't the whole personnel. You know, Trump was very involved in picking his cabinet, things like that, right? But the president can't, well, there's so many political jobs, it's 4,000. Yeah. You can't possibly be involved in all of it. That's why you have to outsource it to PPO. The problem is, Nobody except the establishment knew how important PPO was. They didn't know that these people are actually making, they're, they're, they're doing the decision making, right? They're supposed to be hiring people going along with the agenda, but it was viewed as more of an HR processing center, and it's not that. That was the strategic error. PPO is the president's number one tool to manage the bureaucracy. It's not an HR processing center. And Trump deserves credit because Reagan didn't realize this. Nobody realized this. Trump's the only president that did realize it, period, at all. He's the only person that put someone extremely aligned with his agenda, willing to push these things, willing to push um, 
very conservative Republicans in. He's the only guy to put someone in to do that. Um, so that that's the way I look at it. I would, yeah, I would, um, if there was one thing, and this has been publicly uh, written about as well, but the first impeachment uh, was sort of a catalyst because you had someone who was at the White House every day on the National Security Council who caused this whole thing, who, who uh, should never have been there, who was 90% 90, 90 about of the National Security Council was career. Um, so I think that was one moment uh, that, that sort of inspired him. Yeah, there's, there's so many things the president has to deal with. But that reminds me, Spencer, one of the reforms that needs to be made on day one in the next administration is kicking the career bureaucrats that are in the White House out of the White House. You would not believe this, but there are literally career bureaucrats on the National Security Council in the Office of Management and Budget that are your enemies walking around in the halls of the White House controlling the building before you even get there. And they have their own HR center that's not even under your control. And there's no reason it has to be like that. So that's just another thing we need to do. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my name is Michelle. I am an assistant director here um, here at Columbus State, New York. So I have a few questions. So you see, you see what's happening right now with the indictment happening um, against uh, former President Trump. So my question is, are you guys willing to play the same game? Because I see a lot of people, a lot of conservatives saying, well, we shouldn't, I mean, it's a dirty ground to play on. You have to get, you know, your feet dirty, you have to get every, everything dirty. So are, when you get into office and go, of course, when President Trump gets into office in 2025, are you willing to play the same exact game with possibly indicting, you know, indicting Fauci or people in the government that were, people that were involved in, um, basically taking away um, America's basic right to decide whether or not to take your classes. Yeah. I personally um, will not be running the Department of Justice, but <laughs> you, you need to put people in place that are hardcore. Like, there are very few people that would be up to this task. So someone I think who could be would be someone like Attorney General Paxton in Texas. You need someone like that to go into DOJ or the FBI and just gun it. Like completely gut it, and then these people are going to be freaking scared if that happens. Um, I don't know. That's that's all I have to say about that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's a perception that the Department of Justice and the FBI are like somehow totally independent of the president, but actually he's the chief law enforcement officer. He's the chief executive officer. We need to reassert that principle. And then on um, on. Uh, Dr. Fauci, I mean, he earned more money than the president. Uh, that's, that's, he's sort of the, the stereotypical example of somebody who has just risen through the ranks and uh, it's pretty crazy when you think about it. Oh, I'm sorry, just uh, one more second question. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys are aware of like the ban of TikTok that's possibly like quote unquote bipartisan thing that's happening, <laughs> uh, happening in, um, in, in the legislature right now. But when you go through the bill, it actually doesn't mention anything about banning TikTok. It has a lot to do with um, basically just controlling VPNs. You can't go on any VPN, the surveillance, uh, um, uh, communications abroad, domestic, basically just making the US Patriot Act look like child's play. Um, so how, how do you plan on, or at least like, what is the, like what, what is the sort of the idea going into like 2025 com and combating that sort of legislation when, when it's quote unquote bipartisan? It's such a good question. And whenever there's a bipartisan push in Washington, you know there's something deeply suspect. <laughs> The TikTok ban. The TikTok ban is a great question. Here, I I have a minority view on this. I think that the reason the GOP is pushing so hard to ban TikTok is because they want to fool their constituents into thinking they're taking on big tech. It's like no, TikTok is actually cutting into big tech's profits. It's destroying big tech. If you look at the people that want the TikTok ban. It's Facebook more than anyone else. It's Google. They're funding it. They have armies of lobbyists pushing this. And hope, I don't think the Restrict Act's gonna pass, but if they do ban TikTok, just don't let the GOP get away with not dealing with Facebook and Google, because those are the real problems. They're way more powerful than TikTok. TikTok is tiny in comparison, but it's hurting their profits. So 
I think it's a distraction. I think it's a total distraction. Yeah, yeah um, just for, for a goal uh, that you guys could set right now. If you had, I know it's tough with numbers and everything, but how many people are getting fired on January 21st, 2020? Like, what is a number that I could be like, you guys, you guys messed up, you, you didn't fire, and I'm like, you're talking like 500 people, 500, I mean, all the Biden politicals, right? So I'm, that's at least 4,000. Right? They'll have to resign, but that doesn't count. Okay, so yeah, I'm talking like pink slip, like they didn't see it coming, just someone hey, walked in and said, over, pack uh, your stuff yeah. and get out. On day one, we have to, so the reduction in force exercise is called riffing, right? right? On day one, we have to riff every single diversity, equity, and inclusion office across the federal government. Every, every single one, they have to be riffed. And you can literally just do it. It's that easy. You can say, this is obsolete now. Because Congress doesn't name it in the bill. It doesn't say this diversity inclusion officer will be at this agency. And if the Congress doesn't explicitly name it, you can rip it. Yeah, we, um, we, we in addition to that, we need uh, to reclassify positions through Schedule F and other things. Um, and, you know, I think we, I think putting a number on it uh, would, it might take away from the fact that we've got a lot of different tools in the toolbox and we need to explore um, you know, each, each of those uh, tools, whether it's reassigning people, moving agencies out of DC. When the Bureau of Land Management at the Department of Interior relocated to Grand Junction, Colorado, about two thirds of the uh, employees just didn't make the move. Uh, so you can do things like that too. Because if you start fire, if you fire people, you are going to get sued. Like it'll be held up for, for you know, for years uh, in court, so. Any lessons from the Federalist Society and the success of building a judicial pipeline and how you can apply that to the executive branch? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think things like the Manhattan Project, like what Mike is doing here, are incredible. The people are out there. The, the people with political experience are the people you need. These are political jobs. It's not enough. You could have the best businessman in the world, the smartest, sharpest, most competent guy. And if you put him in a, in a political appointee position, he is going to fail. If he doesn't have some political sense, some campaign experience, something like that, they're going to fail. So I don't know a lot about the Federalist Society, but what I can tell you is that groups like the Manhattan Project and the ones that are a part of the pipeline that are coming into Project 2025, they're selecting people for political experience. We want people that have worked on campaigns, that have worked in the, in the broader movement. Like those people have the sense. They can tell when you know, a bureaucrat is trying to water down the policy or when they actually do, when there actually is a real legal objection to something. You need to have that political sense. And so organizations that are doing that are the key. I would also say, um, you know, the Federalist Society was founded because of a few Supreme Court decisions from the 60s and 70s that altered the country um, in bad ways. Obviously, Roe v. Wade is the number one, but they, for 40 years, 50 years, um, they put their mind to it. We have got to overturn Roe v. Wade. We've got to build the team. We've got to, uh, you know, have new vetting processes for judges. We've got to have, you know, so that whenever there's a conservative president, we have people, you know, who are going to, uh, who are going to reverse some of those decisions. And I mean, that's a very good thing. And uh, the the life issue is the whole reason I first got involved in politics. But we need to do that for every issue, and we need to do it to uh, with the objective of deconstructing the administrative state. Um, as a movement, you know, just just methodically put our mind to it, uh, and it might be, you know, uh, decades, but we ultimately can do it if you if you if you just make it a single issue. Yeah. Is there a question? I think more for Spencer. Um, you said that it was, uh, I guess, the program itself is going to be a bit more, or use the phrase big tent. Um, how do you ensure a that like none of like the old school establishment parent Republicans kind of get their way into it. And then B, uh, once you do sort of have these, these uh, people that are in there maybe from different ideological backgrounds, how would you control for like some major policy differences that are libertarian and somewhat not like the popular yeah. that might have with each other? 
Okay, so the goal of it being a big tent is not, uh, it's not really ideological. It's so that it's a big tent and that we can say to the next nominee, to the next president, this is what the whole conservative movement expects and demands. Um, now, you'll see in the policy book that comes out, you know, we have, the conservative movement is united on a lot of stuff. Um, on all the three letter acronyms of federal agencies that need to be rooted out, we're gonna be very strong on that. We're gonna be very strong on life and family, very strong on the border crisis, you know, very strong on most of the issues where the movement is united. On some areas like trade or um, uh, foreign policy, you know, we did more of a, uh, you know, bracket out the areas of disagreement and sort of provide a menu of options to the next president. Um, and that's what, in, I think as the uh, as the candidates come into focus, we'll be able to put certain filters on the project that go, you know, um, in in whatever direction uh, the the next president will want to go. But uh, so that's why it's a big tent. Um, and then I think you know it's it's all about PPO. It's all about the future presidential personnel office. Um, if we have a team running it, like like our team. Um, I think we we will be uh, in, a, in a good situation. I think we kind of had it figured out by the end. Uh, but it, um, yeah, we, we know that everybody, we know that all the special interests are gonna be ready and all the establishment people are gonna be ready. So it's a question of being ready. Uh, yeah, there's enough where we agree on and we need to get people from outside the beltway into the next administration. That's That's what part of this is. They can't be the same Washington DC Republicans because it's not even, it's less ideological and it's that the DC Republicans want to go along to get along with the bureaucracy because they live in DC. These are their peers, these are their colleagues. These are the people they're gonna go lobby once they go to K Street. They're reliant on getting along with the bureaucracy. We want people from outside DC that aren't interested in just climbing the DC ladder, aren't interested in becoming a lobbyist. So it's not ideological in that, in that sense. The key, the secret sauce is young people from outside the beltway. If we get young, like grassroots conservatives, I mean, they are not gonna know what hit them. Mike. What is the importance of clubs like the New York and Republican Club in identifying and generating such individuals? Because you say you want people with a political sense but we don't want someone within the beltway. We don't want businessmen, but we want people who are outside of the political environment. Yep. Yep. So no one can identify these people by themselves. It's a massive project. We're relying on you guys to find these people that are aligned. You have your networks, you know? Everyone has their network. You know the guys that have a sharp political sense. They might be in Wall Street, but they're very much up on the politics. They're into it. It's not that it's not necessarily that they have to have worked on a political campaign. That's certainly helpful, but they just have to have a political sense. They have to get it at a fundamental, instinctual level, and only you can tell that. That's why we're going to be relying on conservative orgs to recommend people because you guys are close to them. You will know. Also. I think people forget that uh, you know personnel is policy. That's a cliche, but it's true. But there are a, lar a lot of people um, who are you know maybe more establishment-minded folks. But if they see young conservatives, grassroots types, um, doing the the right thing, making the tough decisions, and being bold, they actually will come over to our side. Um, and we you know we can't forget that. Um, that example that we set as well is helpful in bringing on, bringing over the more experienced people and and you know getting them to uh, to do the right thing on behalf of the president. Um, so a lot of us, of course, are disappointed with how we had you know Trump for four years, and then it seemed just like overnight everything had been reversed. Yeah. And I think you know that what you're trying to do sounds like you know you really want to take a wrecking ball to to, to the situation and you know put people in charge who
there's, I mean, there's a concern now. We might, we might not get a MAGA candidate in the White House now. We might not even win. Um, let's say we got someone like a Nikki Haley in. I mean, that would be, that wouldn't be good. It, even in that case, though, even in that case, though, we should still try to do this. We should still try to run the presidential personnel. It's going to be harder if you don't have a president aligned. But you could, you could ironically make the Haley administration really, you know, pretty good if you actually just ran the personnel. It's that powerful. Like, it, it has that much of an impact. So we should try no matter what and no matter who the candidate is. And I, what Spencer was saying is once you start doing these things, the bureaucrats, like the establishment, will get in line. It, you know, if we actually succeed at this, it will cause a generational shift. So I think, I think if we, I think the culture would shift enough where you're not getting somebody in there that isn't going to be on board with this, if that makes sense. And I'll, I'll add on, reasserting the proper power of the presidency is going to be a good thing for any conservative president because we, we don't have the bureaucracy. The political makeup of the DMV, where I'm from, it's not as bad as Manhattan, but it's not good. Uh, you know, the Virginia, Maryland, DC, like the, the, the talent pool for uh, conservatives is smaller. So if you have a powerful president, Congress never passes anything. You know, it's all uh, done through regulations at the agencies. Um, it's like, it's, the left is gonna have that no matter what, whenever they have the presidency. We don't have it, so it, it can't hurt to, uh, you know, to believe in, in the president's power of appointment and the other powers that, that people don't understand or fully appreciate. Last question, right? Yeah. So um, in, in your previous response to the last question, you, you mentioned culture. And what, let's just face it, let's be honest, conservatives have, just, have sucked at culture. We have. I mean, you know, it's not like we, we're, no, we're, we're losing our, 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 our traditional values, family values, as, as, we can, as we can see. But how do you plan on, or at least trying to create a guide on influencing the younger generation, but especially culture, because of course, like the cliche saying goes, politics is the downstream of culture. And the Democrats have had a good hand on that. So how do you plan on executing it going forward, trying to influence a lot of, not just young conservatives or young libertarians, libertarian like myself, but how do you plan on just saying, you know what, this big problem, uh, we have one of the, one of the gay generations ever. <laughs> so how do you plan on uh, executing a plan to influence culture? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, get on TikTok. No, um, I, think, I think we have to stick together. Um, I actually have a dating app for that, is the real answer. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad I can kind of plug it now, because you asked a semi-tangential question. Um, but I don't know. Conservatives need to stick together um, when it comes to everything, dating, etc. Um, because there's not there's not much left in this country. But <laughs> there's, there's not much left. But the good thing is conservatives do have better culture. Like our memes are way funnier. <laughs> our our comedy is way funnier because we have truth on our side. Um, you know, I think. There's a lot of people doing a lot of good cultural stuff and it's better quality. You look at Hollywood now, every movie they turn out is crap. All the woke stuff, all the woke, the woke stuff is destroying culture. So hopefully people will step up and do that. But the dating app is called The Right Stuff. It's the dating app for conservatives and if you're single, you should get on it. Uh, politics is, is downstream from culture, but culture is also downstream from politics. And great political leaders can shape or reshape the culture. Um, we saw with President Trump in 2015, everybody was talking about him as a candidate, even if you didn't support him, right? Like uh, a strong, strong political leadership is something that can mold the culture. Um, so I think we, we uh, need to understand that that goes both ways. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.